Hey guys, it's been 6 months since the original Iceberg video, and wow has a lot happened since then. One thing that's happened consistently is me getting comments on that video telling me I was wrong. Some were right in calling out some things I missed, and some were… heavy allegations to say the least. In response, I decided to do the same thing again, this time with even more obscure and arguably controversial topics thanks to Ira Merson on Reddit. I don't want y'all to click off too early, so let's just get into the expansion pass for the Pokemon Iceberg. Shorts are comfy and easy to wear. All the way back in the original Pokemon games, you would come across a youngster named Ben, who ecstatically proclaims his love for shorts and their convenience. The humorous and unprecedented nature of this remark made this specific trainer one of the most well-known to this day, even being referenced in more than one of the newer games. Ash's Father Ash, like most other Pokemon protagonists, does not have a dad the audience gets to see. That doesn't mean that he isn't mentioned, though. In the second episode, Ash's mom says his dad is simply on his own journey, and no matter how many characters people say are actually Ash's dad, we still don't know for sure. I can take a wild guess, though, and say the people who say Mr. Mime are not correct. Bootleg Pokemon Cards if you're a fan of Pokemon cards, or were when you were a child, chances are you've seen some goofy, fake Pokemon cards. There's not much to say about these cheap attempts to make quick money off the hobby, so here's a card I convinced myself was just a misprint when I was 10. Bug Catching Inspired the Series As was the case with many young boys living in rural Japan in the 1970s, Satoshi Tajiri was very into catching bugs. The only thing he ended up liking more was video games. These two interests, combined with him witnessing bug catching dwindling out as a popular hobby, led him to create Pokemon. This gave the rush and discovery of catching insects to kids who lived in areas where it wasn't possible. After six years of development, his magnum opus was made. Then, 26 more years later, here I am telling his story. Diglett's Feet For years, people have theorized what the underground part of Diglett looked like. Some of these have been tame, and some of them have been less than tame. All we do know is that there's feet somewhere down there. This is based on a passing conversation in the game Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team. He states that his feet still feel like he's walking on air, much to the confusion of his peers. Event Pokemon since the beginning of time, there have been Pokémon that were unobtainable in the base games. These range from mythical Pokémon like Mew, to Pikachus who wear funny hats. They could also be acquired in unique ways, like putting in codes online, to having to go to in-person events to have them manually gifted. And as we will learn later, the Nintendo in-person distribution service could have been used for evil. Kanto is a real place. The name and landscape of the original Pokémon region was taken directly from the real-life Kanto region in Japan. What makes this special is the shared name, which is unique from other regions based on real-world locations, like Alola being Hawaii and Galar being Britain. Nuzlocke Runs Back in the year 2010, college student Nick Franco decided to make a more difficult version of his Pokemon Ruby playthrough. He had to only catch the first Pokemon in every route, and all Pokemon had permadeath. He loved doing it so much he made a webcomic to share his experience where he would draw his Nuzleaf with the face of John Locke from the show Lost. This lovable little guy became the face of the comic, which led to the challenge itself being referred to as a Nuzlocke. If you want to see an example, I actually did one on my channel and you should check it out after this. Mew Glitch Back in the original Iceberg, I mentioned this. This is particularly funny because there is an unrelated glitch that allows you to catch Mew. That glitch involved fighting special people, walking special ways, and a whole lot of special menuing hijinks. It's almost comforting to know that goofy menu glitches have been part of the franchise since the beginning. Pokemon Gender Differences All the way back in the second generation of Pokemon games, Pokemon were given gender. They could be male, female, or neither. Starting in the fourth generation, many Pokemon were actually given visual differences between male and female versions. Many of these were subtle, but some standout ones are Wobbuffet, where the female has lipstick, 
or Pikachu, where each gender has a different shaped tail. Pokemon Go Controversies Hit 2016 mobile game Pokemon Go did a lot to get people going outside, which is awesome. The downside of that is it caused a lot of people to be outside doing unfavorable things, such as trespassing or not looking while crossing the street. Even today in 2022, there was a story of cops ignoring a robbery in progress for the sake of catching a nearby Snorlax. I was going to end with a quip, but honestly, I don't know if I can top that. Pokemon References in Media Being the largest media franchise in the world means you'll have your fair share of parodies and references in other popular media. To save you from me reading the whole list, I'll just say some of my favorites, like The Simpsons, Johnny Test, and for some reason, the many times it's mentioned in the 2001 Fox sitcom Grounded for Life. ROM Hacks and Fan Games also, what comes with having a gaming franchise so big is fan creation. If you go on Google right now, you can find hundreds of Pokemon games created by fans. Some really do offer a vast experience never seen by players before, while some mostly aim to just be a more edgy and mature experience than normal Pokemon. If you want to see an example of the former, my aforementioned Nuzlocke was in a fan game, and I will shamelessly tell you to check it out again after this video. Satanic Panic Along with Harry Potter and any other magic-based pop culture, Pokemon was put on blast by those involved with the Satanic Panic of the 80s and 90s. After reports of Satanic rituals, the entire country and even other parts of the world became so sheepish towards media that they were convinced anything and everything were trying to take Christianity out of our children's lives. One main proponent of this facet of the panic was Stephen Dolenz, who would write books about why Harry Potter was bad and did whole press meetings on the dangers of Pokemon. I highly recommend finding his presentation if you can. It's an absolute pleasure. The Pokerap. For the first three generations of Pokemon, there were songs put at the end of anime episodes that showed all the Pokemon in their respective generations. All the Pokemon being an overstatement because some Pokemon did actually get left out. And sometimes they said a Pokemon's name and showed a different Pokemon. After there started being too many Pokemon, there stopped being official Pokemon raps. Luckily, we have people like Brian David Gilbert, who had blessed us with his perfect Pokemon rap, with 812 of the current 898 Pokemon released. It may not be perfect anymore number-wise, but it's still perfect to me. I heard you like Mudkips. Back in the wonderful year of 2005, some innocent Mudkip fans on DeviantArt created the Mudkip Club. When inviting artists to join the club, the owner would initiate with the famous phrase, so I heard you like mudkips. Like anything wholesome, however, the phrase was then sullied by users on 4chan, who added it into a lewd copy pasta and made it way far into the corners of the internet. Luckily, this travesty of a story is not what we fondly remember today about the beautiful phrase, I heard you like mudkips. There's nothing like a jelly-filled donut. Many aspects of the original Pokemon anime were changed in the US by their dub created by the licensing company 4Kids. Some of these changes were inconsequential, but some changed the original vision of the show. Some also were just funny and landed the moments in the long-term memory of children across the country. This was the situation with Brock and his rice balls. I'm calling them rice balls because that's what they are. 4Kids, however, called them donuts. This humorous juxtaposition between what he said and what he was holding created a meme that still doesn't fail to make me laugh. Arceus Mentioned by Dr. House In the Fox drama House MD, the main cast is trying to pinpoint the cause of a patient's symptoms. This is when the titular doctor says that when Arceus created the universe, he created 300 poisons that could be the culprit. When questioned, he told them to simply look it up. This should be the end of the entry, but when this reference was pointed out on Reddit, there was a large community saying he was actually referencing the old alchemy term Arceus, and they were glad it wasn't just a cringy Pokemon reference. What they failed to think about is that this was 100% within House's character to be making cringy Pokemon references. Could Sonic save Pikachu? The intro cutscene to the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Story Mode shows a montage of all your favorite characters being annihilated. Among these is Sonic and Pikachu. As Pikachu trails behind, Sonic slows down and extends his arm in an attempt to save the rat. 
This is a fruitless effort, however, and both fall victim to vaporization. This moment blew up on social media, causing a lot of conversation and memes. More than anything, it made me nostalgic for those subspace emissary cutscenes, showing similar things happening. GS Ball The GS Ball was a long-time Japanese exclusive event item for Pokemon Crystal. In the West, it served a much larger purpose in the anime, as the event in the West to get the ball was scrapped until the Virtual Console release years later. Coincidentally enough, its arc in the anime was also scrapped. To honor the unlucky item, I keep one on my Pokeball shelf. This shelf isn't complete, by the way. If you want to send me a Pokeball 2DS, hit me up. My Twitter DMs are open. Nessa Whitewashing Controversy You might think after the backlash from me discussing the Jinx racism controversy, I would shy away from these topics. Instead, this is an opportunity to say I'm simply sharing events and not my opinions. Please stop yelling at me for the localization team's decisions 25 years ago. Anyways, Nessa was a character introduced in Pokemon Sword and Shield. Her reveal garnered a lot of hype for her design, her attitude, and the fact there was some more strong representation in Pokemon. This led to a lot of fan art, including this image. The skin tone of the character is lighter than that of the original art, which brought forth many debates on whether or not it could be considered whitewashing. Through this, many people were informed on what whitewashing was, but there were still many people being racially insensitive just for the sake of being contrarian. Despite the bad, I'm glad we were able to discuss something that is so important in the world of fan art. No Dark Type Gems First off, this is no longer true considering the addition of Pierre and Sword and Shield. Still though, it took 20 years or so for them to add Dark Type Gym Leaders, why is that? Well, the Japanese word for Dark Type also means Evil Type. Considering gym leaders are not only chosen for strength, but by being a good role model and community member, it didn't make sense for them to use the evil type. It had also been pointed out that most of the dark type Pokemon were saved for the use of the evil team members. Even in Sword and Shield, the closest we have to an evil team uses dark types, and their effective leader is the dark type gym leader. Pokemon Creepy Black Unfortunately, we aren't talking about the real Pokemon Black. Instead, we're looking at our first creepypasta of the iceberg. I don't want to dwell on them too long unless they add something new to the formula, which this one simply does not. Maybe it did in 2010, but not anymore. Regardless, a man boots up Pokemon Red to see that he has the ghost from Lavender Town in his party. Not only are enemies afraid to attack it, but by using the move Curse, it is implied that the opponent's Pokemon, uh, cease living. When they have no Pokemon left, they also cease living. The game ends when the ghost turns on the player and sends him to Brazil along with the others. Snorlax is based on a programmer. As someone who is comedically short, I understand being defined by one physical trait. I, however, will not be immortalized for this in any way comparable to game designer Koji Nishino. Because of his large stature, Ken Sugimori found him to be the perfect model for Snorlax. This alone is funny. But there's rumor that Snorlax's Japanese name contains the word mold, as a reference to Nishino's nickname he received for eating food regardless of its mold quantity. Sun and Moon Sexual Innuendos Pokemon, as with most children's media, is full of innuendos. This seems to have gotten either more prominent or just got more attention in 2016-17 when the game's Pokemon Sun and Moon. Of course, I don't plan on sharing many of these, but people are sure taken aback by how many people hit on the player, and the one guy who gets really hype about the oncoming foursome. The Pokemon Timeline Similar to The Legend of Zelda, Pokemon has quite a busy timeline. What we know is that Kanto and Hoenn happen first, followed by Johto and Sinnoh, followed by Unova, then Unova again and Kalos, and then Alola, and then Galar. I didn't say games, because if I started using games, I would have to start talking about multiverses, which this concept splits the timeline into multiple parts depending on things like remakes and whether or not there's mega evolution. Bulbapedia has a fairly comprehensive list of events in the timeline that whether or not you believe it's right, I've used it before and plan on using it again, so I will die to defend it. The Pokewalker if I told you to point at one of the most effective and accurate pedometers on the market in 2011, you'd probably choose something techy looking like this or this. In reality, you'd be better off looking into the heart gold and soul silver peripheral, the Pokewalker. The Pokewalker encouraged kids to get outside and walk, 
with the trade-off of training Pokemon and getting exclusive content. What they didn't intend was to stomp out the competition so hard that they would use all the same internals with a different coat of paint two years later and continue to be one of the best pedometers on the market. A sports game, Dad will like that. In Pokemon Red, watching a TV in the Celadon department store brings up the dialogue, a sports game, dad'll like that. This shows that even if the player doesn't know anything about Red's father, he at least knows enough to say that he likes sports. More importantly, the word will insinuates that his father is still alive, to the dismay of many theorists. Also, it implies that he will either see his father at some point to tell him, or knows where his father is and that he will see the game too. If you like this game, buy it or die. During the trend of creepy anti-piracy images, this screenshot of Pokemon Fire Red began to trend. At the Vermilion Seaport, instead of his usual dialogue, the sailor says, if you like this game, buy it or die. The people who dumped this ROM said explicitly that they did not add it, but also if you wanted to create a viral screenshot, why would you admit to it? Even more interesting is that this was not created during the trend of anti-piracy screens, but actually a solid 10 years before it got all that viewership. This is also the time period it was confirmed to not be in the game's actual code. Tough. Six Finger Electabuzz I already talked about Pokemon Stadium's Six Finger Electabuzz in the first iceberg, I just wanted to remind you how much I love him. Altering Cave Altering Cave is a location in Fire Red, Leaf Green, and Emerald that is famous for having a lot of potential. The original intention was that through the mystery gift, rare and special Johto Pokemon could be obtained, such as Shuckle, Teddy Ursa, and Smurgle. Instead, the event never happened, and all it does is serve as another location to catch Zubats. In Emerald, all these Pokemon in the cave are able to be obtained elsewhere, but in the Gen 1 remakes, you are out of luck. Arcanine was supposed to be legendary. All Pokemon in the Pokedex have a title. For Pikachu, it's the Mouse Pokemon. For Ludicolo, it's the Carefree Pokemon. And for Arcanine, it's the Legendary Pokemon. Despite having this title, it's not considered to be a legendary, but that doesn't mean it was never intended to be. People speculate that the position of Fire-type Legendary was taken by Moltres, but because they still liked Arcanine, they made him a normal Pokemon. My favorite piece of evidence that ties Arcanine in with the legendaries is in the episode Pokemon Emergency, when an ancient tablet showing the legendary birds is seen. The fourth sector is filled up by our resident good boy, Arcanine. Black Belt and Hiker Knob While not exactly the same as having a Pokemon based on you, it would be awesome to be a trainer in one of the games. Even better than one game is four. This is the case for Pokemon localizer Knob O who in Gens 2, 3, Heart Gold, Soul Silver, and Omega Ruby, Alpha Sapphire, has a black belt named after him. Despite being a localizer, he said that this was not his doing, and he would have chosen to be a hiker instead. Little did he know, he was a hiker in the Gen 4 games. Brittany Spiro Continuing on the now real-life shenanigans of Nob, we can get an idea of his life as a translator. While today, Pokemon is not opposed to allowing pop culture references in their games, like these trainers named after the Game Grumps, they were not always so lenient. In the first generation of games, Nob tried to name a Spiro Britney, after the popular singer, especially at the time, Britney Spears. This was not only shot down, but met with the threat of immediate termination if it were to happen again. Camilla in the initial release for the Pokemon mobile game Pokemon Masters, there was code for an unused character named Camilla. This character was supposed to serve as a second rival to the player. Data miners noticed that in all updates afterward, the character's code was removed. This is until November of 2021, where the character was put back into the code, this time to actually be in the game, now named Tina. Despite the change in name, her design remains the same, and she still serves the role of a second rival. Cinnabar Island Destruction Between the events of Generations 1 and 2, the town of Burning Desire becomes a ravaged town of the past after the eruption of the Cinnabar Volcano. This caused the entire town, except for the Pokemon Center, to cease being. The gym moved to Seafoam Island, and the remaining nine residents all moved into one building. Many theorize that this destruction was no accident, but instead Team Rocket going back to cover their tracks in all of the Mewtwo research done on the island. Conker's Bad Fur Day Pikachu Cameo 
The unfinished version of the 2001 Nintendo 64 platformer, Conker's Bad Fur Day, contained a significant amount of cut content. Considering the already overly edgy tone of the game, it was bound to have many moments that rode the line. Seemingly, one of these scenes depicted a mobster attempting to not so nicely catch a Pikachu, before failing and saying the franchise's slogan, gotta catch them all. Lock Capsule Within the game data of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, there was an unused mystery gift item called the Lock Capsule. It actually didn't serve any use in the Gen 4 games, however. Similar to the shiny Legendary Beast event Pokemon, this was intended to be sent to Black and White using the Relocator, where then it would trigger an event. Unlike the Legendary Beasts, this item never came out, and if it did, the player in Black and White would have to take it to Mr. Locke, who would open it and give the player the TM for Snarl, and a note saying to keep the capsule out of the hands of the evil Team Rocket. Meowth's Party if you were a Japanese Pokemon fan in the year 1999, chances are you were in awe at the 3D animated ending theme, Meowth's Party. This song was reused in a tech demo music video in 2001 to show off the graphics of the GameCube. Considering its appearance at a Space World event, Nintendo's biggest game showcase of the year, many people believed Meowth's Party would be getting its own game. This did not end up being true, but the music video was reused in the 2003 game Pokemon Channel, so not all is lost. Pokemon Clover One of the most famous Pokemon fan games is Pokemon Clover. What started out as a Pokemon Fire Red reskin in 2014 has become a Pokemon Goliath, with two unique regions and over 386 original Pokemon. The game itself is based on the meme culture of 4chan, and this is where the clover comes from. From this, you can assume it's slightly more mature than a lot of Pokemon content. I haven't tried it out yet, so I can't recommend it, but it's on my list. Pokemon Crystal DLC In the year 2001, Nintendo of Japan released the Mobile Game Boy Adapter, a peripheral that allowed players to connect their Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance to their phone. Once connected to the phone, players would be able to access the internet. This ability to connect to the internet was supposed to add a lot of content to Pokemon Crystal. Included here was the GS Ball previously mentioned, along with extra places to battle new trainers. The reason it's called DLC and not just event content is because the services provided will almost all have monthly fees tied to them. Pokemon Go Song by Misha during the height of Pokemon Go's popularity, then 9-year-old YouTuber Misha released the Pokemon Go song with his brother. The song was harmless, slightly annoying at most, and did not warrant the waves and waves of hate that it brought forth. In the approximately 6 years since the song's release, Misha has moved on to release more music, most notably his EP, Not The One, only last year. Pokemon Pink Though this sounds like it will be another fan game, it's really not. In the files of Pokemon Yellow, there were many files hinting towards there being a game to go with Pokemon Yellow, called Pokemon Pink. It was assumed because of its status as potential mascot, that Clefairy would have been the mascot of this sister game. Many people theorized that Game Freak was taking the term sister game too heavily, and planned on targeting Pokemon Pink to girls exclusively. Considering the time was heavily weighted down by gender stereotypes, and other games were trying hard to get girls as potential customers, I wouldn't say this idea isn't possible. Pokemon Play It Before we had Pokemon Trading Card Game Online, or Pokemon Card Game Live, our only resort to play with Pokemon cards on the computer was the 1999 game Pokemon Play It. This was a computer game mostly for the purpose of teaching the card game's mechanics to players. While the original only allowed for one opponent to fight, the sequel gave the player 15 levels. Along with actually playing the game, both programs allowed you to take quizzes to earn printable certificates to prove you were the coolest kid on the playground. Recruiting Kecleon Pokemon Mystery Dungeon falls into the video game trope of having an extremely strong shopkeeper NPC who can easily mow down anyone who steals from them. In a game where beating Pokemon in battle is how you recruit them, it makes sense that you can get this ungodly force on your team, right? Technically, yes. Kecleon has a smaller recruitment rate than even the strongest of legendary Pokemon, and the only way to bring that chance up is to beat the behemoth over and over again. For many, it takes thousands of defeated shopkeepers before one even slightly considers joining the same team of Pokemon who would ever steal their goods. Shaman says thank you. 
All Pokemon that exist have a cry. This is the noise they make, just like a dog barking or a cat meowing. Some of them are more unique than others, like Cricketune or Regirock. In the case of the Gratitude Pokemon Shaman, trainers noticed that slowing down its cry sounded like it was saying thank you. I've listened to it many times and can sometimes kind of hear it, but you can judge for yourself. Sonichu Sonichu is the main character in the comic of the same name by the infamous Chris Chan. You can assume based on their name exactly what the character is a combination of. To avoid making another documentary on the life of its creator, I want to just give some information on the comic itself. After only the second issue, Sonic was replaced as the main character with Chris Chan himself, and the comic went on, there were obvious signs showing the declining mental health of its creator. The comic is no longer being created after a gross and sinister legal case involving the creator. Alright, I kinda just talked about the creator, sorry. Unknown Radio Signal When searching for music for creepy videos, I get to revisit a lot of locations from the games that frightened me as a child. One of these locations was the Ruins of Alf. The idea of ancient ruins? Creepy. The music? Creepy. Unknowns, but only because of the Entei movie? Creepy. Icing on the cake, though, was the staticky and eerie radio signals you got on your Pokegear. Some of these were actually distorted Pokemon cries, or the melody created by the Azura flute. For me, this was the second scariest thing in all of Pokemon, only behind finding Garantina before I knew it existed. The Spanish dub roasts Digimon. Despite the strict rules on translating the early games to English, the modern Latin American dub of the show has not had as much issue. In the black and white arc of the anime, there is a villain who tells their henchmen if they want to continue to be useless, they should just go to Digimon. I'm going to be transparent in saying that at the time of writing this, I cannot for the life of me find the exact quote, so take my word for it, or if I eventually find it, I'll throw it on screen. Watergate Prior to the release of Pokemon Black and White, a member of the image board 4chan leaked the final evolutions for the region's starters. This leak was met with criticism, considering how much many fans disliked the designs and the point in time they were shown. These images were revealed before we even knew the English names for the base level starters. This is where the name Watergate comes from, because the fan name for Oshawa at the time was Water, and the leaked design of Samurott was what made fans most upset. Lo and behold, these leaks were real, and this led to one of the angriest days in the history of the Pokemon boards on 4chan. Alolan Executor in Gen 1 Generation 7 introduced many new forms to a lot of old favorites. Included in these was the Coconut Pokemon Executor. After its release, fans noticed something oddly familiar about the strange new form. After looking into it, people remembered a strange image of Executor on the Jungle Expansion Booster Box in Japan. In the year 1997, there was a long-necked Executor depicted on the box. It's obvious this idea for the character has been around for a long time, and I bet the creators were excited to officially put it in a game 20 years later. Chinese Riddler Going back to the topic of leaked information, one of the most famous Pokemon leakers is known as the Chinese Riddler. For years, this individual has posted Pokemon leaks in the form of random images, leaving the fans to insinuate what they mean. Many people are upset that they don't just come out and say the leaks, but others believe that they do this to avoid getting caught by Nintendo. Technically, all they're doing is posting funny, goofy pictures. Here is the current list of Legends Arceus leaks they have made. This video should be out after the game's release, so let me know in the comments if they were right. Earthbound Mother Connections Fans for many years have noted similarities between the Pokemon franchise and the Earthbound games. Creatures Incorporated, which is a large part of Pokemon, is created by former employees of the company that made Earthbound. Through this, many employees and important figures from Earthbound had a hand in the original Pokemon games. Within the actual universe of the games, people point out the importance of psychic powers, the similarities in character archetypes, and the many ways that Mewtwo and Gigas are similar beyond just being final bosses. I haven't played Earthbound myself, so I don't have any stuff to say here. I'm just the messenger. Mad Pikachu Creepypasta number 2, let's go. This one left me shocked after reading it, and its absurdity may make it my favorite creepypasta I've ever read. 
Essentially, a kid invites his friend over to play Nintendo 64, and upon arrival, they decide to play Pokemon Yellow. In this game, you are given one Pikachu in the beginning, but the main character's friend managed to catch six. He then leaves our hero with the game, and upon playing it more, the six Pikachus exit the TV and unalive the child. By the time the parents find him, all that's left is blood coming out of the TV, spelling the word mad. Nintendo denies this happening, until the friend tells them that he had caught six Pikachus, leaving them all speechless. I don't know about y'all, but I'm probably gonna have trouble sleeping tonight. Mewtwo is the perfect Christian role model. Perfect may be a strong word, but that doesn't mean the Church of England doesn't at least value Mewtwo's story in some capacity. Former theological secretary Anne Richards made multiple comments on her view on Mewtwo's character arc as a parallel to the Christian idea of salvation. For most of their life, Mewtwo has spite towards its creator, and from this comes anger. It isn't until seeing Ash sacrifice himself for his friends that Mewtwo is able to effectively repent and renounce his sinful ways. This was probably not intentional by the creators, but if this is the interpretation that one wanted or needed out of the movie, I'm glad it was there for them. And that's one of the most wonderful things about art. Pocket Monsters 64 Before we had console Pokemon RPGs like Pokemon XD or Sword and Shield, the Pokemon Company intended to release the first console Pokemon game for the Nintendo 64 disk drive. This game was intended to be released with Hey You Pikachu. The difference between the games is that Hey You Pikachu actually came out. One reason credited with the game's failure to launch is Masuda saying he didn't think a Pokemon RPG was meant to be released on consoles. That or they were kept very busy by Gold and Silver. Or the fact the disk drive never happened. Regardless, we were lucky to get Pokemon Coliseum only a few years later, which is arguably the best way to introduce Pokemon RPGs to home consoles. Pokemon 2000 Adventure Game To promote the second Pokemon movie, the company released an entire browser for the sake of playing an online game. This game became lost media due to it being pulled after only one month because of a contract dispute. Certain aspects, though, were left up for many years, allowing us to at least have an idea of what it was like. The game would have the player travel to islands guarded by the legendary birds. On these islands, the player would catch Pokemon and answer trivia to acquire special orbs. This is where our knowledge of the game cuts off. We don't really know what happened after you found all of the orbs. Pokemon Gold Rescue Team Continuing on the train of Lost Media, Pokemon Gold Rescue Team is a Korean PC version of Pokemon Blue Rescue Team. The only thing we have left of this game is the one screenshot of the title screen, and comedically enough, the native resolution. Otherwise, we are entirely left in the dark when it comes to this mysterious Mystery Dungeon demo. Pokemon Gun in a Mexican Newspaper even though the trend of having a definitive edition game ended with Pokemon Platinum, players still joke about them when new games come out. When it came to Pokemon Sword and Shield, fans made memes about the third entry being Pokemon Gun. Fans were so earnest with these jokes that it resulted in a newspaper not outright mentioning the gun game, but using the fan-made logo for it as their visual. This was simply an oversight by the publisher, but I could imagine whoever made the logo for the fake game would be honored to now be a published artist. Pokemon Live While Detective Pikachu may be the most remembered live-action version of the Pokemon franchise, that doesn't mean it was the first. Pokemon Live was a musical stage show performed from September 2000 to January 2001. It followed Ash, Misty, and Brock on their journey to get the Diamond Badge from Giovanni and his new Mecha Mewtwo. Subplots included Ash's mom telling him she used to date Giovanni and Misty feeling underappreciated by Ash. All throughout, though, there were many, many musical numbers. There's something equally nostalgic and frightening about this show that finished a whole year before I was even born. Though, the frightening aspect may just come from seeing the pictures of what happened to the puppets after the show ended. Also, if you want to watch it, you can. Stage manager Chris Mitchell posted the entire show onto his YouTube channel, and I'll link it in the description. Pokemon Rebirth. If your biggest gripe with Pokemon is that it wasn't enough like Dragon Ball Z or Naruto, maybe you should consider Pokemon Rebirth. This 2011 manga followed a collection of heroes who would fight evil using their burst power, which allowed them to become Pokemon-human hybrids. There isn't an official English release of this manga, but there are fans who have you covered. 
This uncalled for shonen led to some really cool artwork, and some of the least Pokemon looking Pokemon characters. If you can read Japanese and you have $50 burning a hole in your pocket, you can actually pick up the whole physical set pretty easy on eBay. Pokemon Music in Catherine Gaming superpower Atlas, famous for their Persona series, released the social sim puzzle game Catherine in 2011. In this game, the player plays as Vincent, a man torn between his girlfriend Catherine and the new woman he meets Catherine. None of this seems relevant to Pokemon, and it isn't, but in the files for the original Catherine OST, there is an unused remix of the Pokemon Diamond and Pearl Wild Battle music. I don't know much else about Catherine or its soundtrack, but the remix is actually really cool and I would encourage you to search it up. Pulse Man References Prior to the release of Pokemon, Game Freak created the action platformer Pulse Man for the Sega Master Drive. The game itself looked and sounded beautiful, which is no surprise considering it boasted all the same big names as Pokemon, which came out shortly after. Considering these things, you could guess there would be quite a few references to Pulse Man in Pokemon. Many designs for Pokemon may be based on designs from Pulse Man, such as Registeel or Zatu. Similarly, songs like Barry's Battle Theme and the Dialga Palkia Battle have been compared to songs from the at that point 10 year old platformer. The Pokedex Book There are more Pokedex books than we can count on our fingers and toes. The specific Pokedex book I am talking about here is the 1996 Japan exclusive Pokedex. This book gave us a lot of insight into and inspirations for the original 151 Pokemon. A couple of my favorite fun inclusions include this picture of Pikachu and the lore of Farfetch'd being so delicious that the people of Kanto nearly ate them to extinction. This links with the fact that Pokemon Crystal's Pokedex claims that the Johto region has been making a large effort to breed more of them. Oh, and also, this Gengar is about to unalive someone. The Cerebi Pokeworld is canon. Cerebi.net is the go-to Pokemon database for most players. This is the case for me. I probably owe more than half of my Pokemon knowledge to its webmaster, Mr. Merrick. On this website is a map created to link all of the regions into one image. Though it was not made to be canon, and they even specify this, it managed to receive the highest honor of all, being put in an official Pokemon game. In Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, the map can be seen hanging up on the wall. Victini is based off the atomic bomb. Since its reveal, fans have been creating connections between Victini and the atomic bombs used in World War II. The Pokemon's Dex entry claims that it creates limitless energy in its body, then releases it upon being touched. This is similar to the way an atomic bomb works. Also, it's the Victory Pokemon, which is what was achieved in the war after the use of the horrific weapons. Victini is also found at the Liberty Garden Tower, which could be a sign of it being from the Land of Liberty or America. It all sounds like a stretch to me, but it's interesting nonetheless. The topic was so interesting, in fact, that the Iceberg Maker put it on there twice. Belts instead of badges Upon beating a gym in the main Pokemon games, the player is given a special badge to show their accomplishments. According to a book written by one of Game Freak's developers, the plan was originally to give the player a belt, similar to the colored belt system in Karate. The stranger side of this was the belt would have doubled as a whip to help train your Pokemon. Over time, they shook the idea of using physical force to train your Pokemon, and landed on the completely correct decision to make badges that would look way cooler than a belt ever could. Pikachu Eater Before we had Cramorant to eat all these Pikachus, we had to turn to the 1999 browser game Neopets. Within the game is an encyclopedia of all the most vile and disgusting creatures in the game's world. Included in this book was a creature known as the Pikachu Eater, which was a not-so-subtle reference to Pokemon. This creature was removed, but to this day, hovering over the book when on the website will cause the creature on the cover to reveal a Pikachu in its mouth. Pikachu Virus Continuing on the misuse of the Pikachu character, one year after the release of Neopets, a still unknown jerk released the Pikachu virus on the world. This virus was contained in an email saying something parasocial, like, Pikachu is your friend, click on this link to see him. After clicking the attachment, titled Pikachu Pokemon.exe, your computer would attempt to delete System32 after every startup. Had the program been written better, it would have automatically deleted it as opposed to giving the user the option to stop it. 
Regardless, this was one of the first examples of malicious targeting of children on the internet. Pokemon 731. Pokemon 731 is pick a peck. Next. I'm just kidding. Pokemon 731 is another creepypasta, and serves somewhat as a sequel to the Lavender Town Syndrome story. Instead of just discussing the syndrome itself, it follows the fictional original creator of the song, and the tragedies that followed her after the events of the story. Essentially, not only was there the famous song, but a ghost that haunted the town with terrifying visuals named 731. This Pokemon was based on the secret unit of the Japanese army, famous for the five plus war crimes it committed. The horrifying images were actually the victims of these crimes. If this sounds a little silly, that's because it is, but I will say my synopsis leaves out a lot of the specific, more creepypasta-esque details that may or may not heighten your opinion of the story. Junichi Masuda signs fan art of leaked Pokemon. We've talked about leaks for Pokemon a couple times on this iceberg, but we haven't discussed times where those leaks were outright confirmed by the current composer, director, and producer for games, Junichi Masuda. Leading into the release of Pokemon Sun and Moon, the final evolutions for the starter Pokemon were leaked online. An artist used these designs for a piece of fan art they had signed by the man and myth himself, being told, wait, we haven't revealed these guys yet. Not only did this confirm the most recent leaks at the time, but also the knowledge that even if you bring a company's secret to the autograph event, Masuda may still reluctantly sign it. Pokemon Learning League The inevitable fate of any property made for children is being used in some form of educational media. From Pokemon, one of these educational outlets was the web series titled Pokemon Learning League. This 2006-2009 interactive series taught children things ranging from the water cycle to how to make friends. I was a huge fan of this series, to the point where I asked my teacher if we could watch it in class during the water cycle unit. When I tried to find it, however, it was gone. This is because from 2010 until 2021, the contents of the service were considered to be lost media. Luckily, today we have access to the lessons, and the knowledge that they altered Dawn's design to show significantly less skin. Sega Pico Games While the story as we know it today shows Sega games now being made for Nintendo consoles, this was not always the case. A prime example of the opposite happening is the Pokemon collaboration with a Sega Pico edutainment system. Before we had web series like the Learning League, we had a special console that could interact with special books. Not only were there Pokemon books made for the system, but there was even a special edition Pikachu Pico released. These special books helped children learn things like numbers and letters, all while feeling like they were going on an adventure with their favorite goofy creatures. The way I'm talking it up here makes me feel like the need to specify I'm not sponsored by the 1994 edutainment system, the Sega Pico. 9-11 Appearance Rates In all Pokemon games, Pokemon are found in the tall grass. Every time the player steps into this grass, there's a percent chance that you'll encounter a Pokemon. The programmers took the chance to change this percent chance on certain days. On some holidays like Christmas Eve or St. Patrick's Day, there's an increased chance to find Pokemon. Some days like Christmas and New Year's Eve actually have a smaller chance to find Pokemon. More so than any other type of event, anniversaries of tragedies like 9-11 and the World War II bombings in Japan have the lowest chance to find Pokemon. It isn't outright said why this is the case, but it's believed that it's actually to deter people from playing on days where they should either be with their families, or honoring those lost in the tragedies. Distant Kingdom Play Out for a Scandal Distant Kingdom got their popularity on YouTube by hopping on the trend of complaining about Pokemon Sword and Shield. How they've maintained their platform is their many controversies ranging from racism to transphobic statements. A lot of these are things slightly heavier than what I usually want to talk about, and I'm not a commentary channel, drama is not my thing. But when it comes to potentially harmful statements about minors, in a community largely filled with minors, I would feel amiss not mentioning it. The individual in question has multiple times thrown their hat in the ring. In situations while they're not outright defending their actions, they seemingly go out of their way to not condemn them. These actions go in line disgustingly, so based on their statements defending the sexualization of fictional characters, no matter how young they may be. Researching this has made me feel icky, and after reading all the forms of hateful and like-minded individuals to our creator in question, I need to move on. Stay safe and stay aware, especially if you are a younger member of the community, know who you are supporting and know who you're talking to. 
Racist Gengar. I don't really get a rest from the intense stuff, but that's how it is at the bottom of the iceberg. 13 years ago, at the 2009 Nintendo World, a very special Pokemon was sent out through the mystery gift. This Pokemon was not special for any good reason, however. What was distributed was a shiny Gengar, whose name was a slur for African American individuals, and all of its attack and its ability were based on gross stereotypes. Upon learning about the incident, an investigation was started and the culprit was caught. The man behind the atrocity was walking around the venue dressed like a Team Rocket grunt. Instead of stealing Pokemon, he was stealing the enjoyment out of the self-respecting attendees at what was meant to be a wholesome event. Wow, what a fun iceberg that was. I was scared about doing a second iceberg because I was afraid there wouldn't be enough interesting content to actually discuss. Luckily, I had Ira Merson to help me out. What's nice about doing this iceberg in particular is it's always able to be updated, and I'll post the link in the description so you can suggest your own additions. Maybe one day there will be enough content from you guys I can do a whole new iceberg video. Or maybe I'll find something else to talk about. Only time can tell. Until that day comes, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It's free, so you will always get your money's worth.